Achtung Millwall supports the Lions Food Hub and all of our advertising revenues will be donated to support this fantastic initiative. It's now based at the Lions Centre on Bolina Road and it's run by our own Kelly Webster. This is a friendly food bank supporting families in the Bermondsey and SC16 area. If you can help support the Lions Food Hub in any way, please visit at Lions Food Hub on Twitter or get in touch with us at Achtung Millwall. The Lions Food Hub. Come on, you lions. You're listening to Achtung Millwall, broadcasting from the beautiful South Bermondsey. Except no substitute. Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to... This is developing rapidly into a new tradition, Achtung Extra Shows. And I can only muster up the very finest talent that Achtung Millwall has to offer for this extra show. And that is Mr. Ryan Loftus. How are you doing, Ryan? I'm very well, Nick. It's uh, Achtung Extra Extra this week. I mean, extra, extra. the time is treating you well. I think the listeners can tell uh, there's been a shift in the last year, given the, the volume of content that's now coming out on a weekly basis. Uh, you know, yeah. without the Tuesday game this week, I think you're, you're sat twiddling your thumbs. Yeah, I, I can recommend being retired, listeners. I know, I know. You know, unless you're like a, an insulate Britain activist gluing yourself to the M25, in which case that's the wrong kind of retirement <laughs> for me. I'm not going to go around gluing myself to anything. But um, you know, I can recommend getting into a bit of watching football. Um, I was at Ebbsfleet last night. I actually, went out. That's that's a, that's a marvel. I went out of the house, listeners. Anyway, we, we're straying from the path of why I've got uh, Ryan to um, give up some of his daytime work time for me. Um, Ryan, you wrote a great article on the London football scene uh, website regarding the mythical, fabled thing that we hear about a lot, and somehow it kind of glistens into 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 visibility and goes away. And that's the Millwall Gary Rowett Plan B. Um, you know, some wonder whether it exists. Um, but you've written a great article about the idea that um, that attacking four four two style we saw so brilliantly and briefly last Saturday. Um, as to whether that's that's going to be Gary Rowett's um, approach going forward, certainly at home. Um, a great piece. I enjoyed reading it. Thanks, Nick, very much. It's it's an odd one. I think in the it was an odd week, really, because I, I, I first had the idea for it after the, the Luton game, which what, what struck me was in the second half when, obviously, it wasn't going well, but it was at halftime. And in the second half, Rowett tried to change it, and he made a lot of substitutions. And he did. I think like, the last half an hour, everyone there, the players didn't really know what was going on. No. You know, there was there was no there was a back four, I guess. There was, you know, Ballard out on the right and, and Cooper and Hutchinson in the middle and Malone on the left or but ahead of that it was just a free for all. And it really struck me being like it, a Millwall now so drilled in their back five that if they try and do anything else, does it just fall apart? So I was I was a bit struck by that. But then obviously fast forward a week. And it's a, a, a week with a, a game in the middle where, you know, Millwall won and played well. Um, and then you fast forward a week and the change just makes all the difference. And it was, I was really struck coming away. I, I you know, listened to the pod you did after it and it, a bit why you guys were chatting about it a bit before you got on with Michael and Harry. But, you know, you said about the, the atmosphere when you leave the game and there's a bit of a buzz and you know that you've seen a, a good game. Yeah. And, that was the first time in a in a while. Not to say you know I haven't been enjoying going to Millwall and and you know I'm not happy with Rowett's performance, but that it was the first time in a while I left thinking, wow, Millwall were attacking, they were exciting, and it was it really was really reminiscent of a Millwall side I used to watch. And yeah, it, yeah. It was it was an odd it was an odd feeling, and I know a lot of you guys in the in the chat felt the same. So I thought it'd be interesting to kind of. Rowett mentioned it after after the game that they'd been thinking about mixing it up, and obviously he, he knows that you know the fans aren't necessarily happy at home. He but, would have he would have heard that loud and clear. <laughs> you'd imagine so, but yeah, I thought it'd be good to uh, to mull it over with a a, a senior middle member to to get your thoughts on it. Well, I mean, going back to Saturday, I mean, I think probably, um, and I said this to to Michael and Harry when we recorded. I mean, leaving the ground, I mean, it, you can normally measure the buzz of a Millwall game if people are still chanting, doing the, you know, the monk chant, going under the tunnels. Um, and, and then on Saturday, it continued on down, halfway down Hilderson Road because I think people did feel that um, there was a kind of a nostalgic sense that our Millwall's come back because that's how you expect a Millwall side to 
attack a game and you won't win every game and you won't um, that won't always be um you know as successful as maybe it was last saturday but that's kind of why you go and what certainly for me um you know that's what hooked me into the club very very in the very, very early days so you kind of expect that um i think the thing to uh, to say with gary row and I've, I've read the the article that you've done which is as i say very well drafted I think the thing is, um, and you make the point early on, actually, that there's there's this contrast between what we had Saturday, which is leaving with, you know, you feel all your senses are alive and you're, you're, you're wired into the electric supply, really good. And then actually um, results-wise and statistics-wise and league table-wise, he's not doing that badly. But as he says himself, the, the ground has felt edgy and you wouldn't have known that. I mean, even yeah. at half time, the, the you know on Saturday, the the side left the field to, I I felt slightly unjustified boos, but I think this yeah. becomes a a repeat pattern of behaviour. Once you start booing, you can't stop it. You know, yeah. you, you you need to feel misery. It's a it's an addictive <laughs> drug, misery, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and you know, it wasn't wasn't the worst I've seen that first half. Yet people still felt compelled to boo them off, and I just feel that relieving that was was probably the biggest thing that Gary Rowett's done for the club um, this season. Yeah. Yeah. And, and relieving it in the way that he did, because even, you know, as soon as he changed back and yeah. it's, it's odd, it, as soon as he changed it back from the four, um, the four, four, two, and, you know, he made it four, three, three for a bit, and then went back to the back five, just to hold on to the win and, and did it well. You know, Stoke didn't really threaten, could have had a penalty. No, they game, didn't. No, no. But really didn't have too many chances. But as soon as you see online and, and even in the ground, people weren't happy again. And it's an odd, it is an odd, situation that we're in because realistically we've started really well I mean looking at we've lost three games this season we've lost to Fulham who are second or third we've lost to Luton a very decent side too we played terrible but you know they're they're joint fifth with us and then the blip the really bad one against Cardiff which came immediately after the Fulham game other than that you know and we've played some good sides we've played West Brom um we've played Stoke the LC on the weekend we've played sides that are up and amongst it QPR and we've only lost three out of 14. I mean, I'm minded to think this is probably, you know, maybe not points tally wise, but in terms of losses, probably one of Millwall's best starts to a season. I'd, I'd need to look into that. But yeah, and that's this, a good one. Still that's still sure. yeah. There's still this atmosphere of their discontent, is how I put it in the piece. And it's it's palpable. And, and Rowett knows it's there and all the fans know it there. And it's an odd split. And it's not, you know, a big ask to ask to be entertained at home. Um no, <laughs> most people will tell you that you know. Look, it's been a year without football, without going to see the lines. I mean, watching last season on iFollow was was tough because we all played well, but it was boring for a lot of the time. A lot of the games were edgy and cautious, and it's it's a big ask when you're shipping out a tenner every week at home watching that. And I can understand why people maybe switch off, but now they're back and it's it's part of their lives again. They they just want a, a bit more entertainment, which is. You know, it's this balance in the championship, I guess, between entertainment and points. Because, you know, would people be happy if we were super entertaining, but losing every game and, and you know, four points above the relegation zone? It's easy to say when we're not. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. when we are, it might be a different story then. So it's a bit tricky. And it's, I was in, I was, I, you know, I wanted to look into, obviously, I, I sent pictures of uh, the various screens, uh, various Excel spreadsheets I've been looking at over the last few days. Ryan likes and- Excel spreadsheets, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> <laughs> but necessary evil, I guess. But I, I just I wanted to rather than jump into conclusions, I wanted to, you know, see if what I was thinking had happened over the last couple of seasons is what's happening. And right. one of those things was that I remember Rowett not playing back fives. You know, I remember him adopting it um against I think it was Swansea was the first game on the road and we won one nil and it was a, a, a perfect away performance. It was you know, controlled. We we didn't have much of the ball, but we just shut them out all game and nicked the one goal. Then we did it again at Derby and again at Bristol City. And we were like, hang on, this guy knows what he's doing. I mean, these are completely perfectly calculated plans. You can see exactly what Millwall want to do. They're very good at doing it and they consistently doing it. And But at home, he was still playing a back four. I was, I was looked and it's funny how these things work out. You know, Gary Rowett's first game um, for Millwall on the 26th of October, so, you know, almost a year to the day, was against Stoke at home. Right. And we played a back four. Ben Thompson as a 10, you know, someone who's now not really near the squad and won that game 2-0 and looked very impressive doing it. And 
that was the pattern for a while. It was back four at home, back five away. And it was working. Um, then the next year, um, during COVID, it was a, a bit tougher. We, again, similarly, similarly, he played the back four at home a bit more, especially during that drawing pe- patch, just to, to try and see if we could break it. But this season, you know, the two times we've played a back four have been when we're behind in games. And, you know, we've come back against Blackpool doing it and now against Stoke. And it seems that Rowett has just, you know, he's adopted the the back five as his as main system. And, you know, it makes sense to an extent, you know, out of our seven best players, what, six of them are, are defenders and a goalkeeper. I mean, you make that point in the piece. And I think he says that he's got players, uh, good mm-hmm. defenders. I mean, and they are, I, I think you've got to... Any any fair judge has got to acknowledge that we, you know, our, our main bulk of our talent lies in the defensive side of of, of, the, of the of the game. Um, so yeah, why well, you know he as he I think he can't remember he puts it, but he says it would be a fool not to use those players and and a, a system that has um, you know produced some some measure of um, success. Um, I, I think, and I wanted to ask you, Ryan, that it's. The, the downfall in, in football is is not one system over another, in my opinion. And um, mm. I keep putting five three two. You've got five five two three, um, and a contrast that probably the great contrast goes four four two, um, because under Neil Harris we were the kind of archetypal four four two side, and um, you know we achieved some measure of success with it whilst we had the den on side. And you know, I, I, as a, the, the thing strikes me is that it doesn't necessarily matter which system you're playing, as long as the the system that you play and the players that you're using understand it and pass the ball in an appropriate way for that particular system. Because we were using on Saturday um, at times um, either Tom Bradshaw as a slight target man when he hasn't yeah. got the physique to to take those long high balls. He's not Matt Smith in that sense. Mm. Or we're trying to play balls over the top. Uh, into channels that were just not clicking. I mean, they're being over overcooked yeah. at times, and you know, so the fr- there, there was a frustration in the way the players were playing. Now, if one of those balls over the top had been perfectly pitched into the path of either Bradshaw or, or, or Wallace, and they're through on goal and we're one 0 up, then the thing starts to look and sound a bit different. Suddenly, yeah. that formation, Ryan, is is yeah. you know the work of genius. You know. that's, that's the thing, and that's the difference with uh, the away from home performances. When you've got defenders to soak it up, and especially when he first came in, we've got the pace on the break to to capitalise on it. It looks brilliant. You know, on the the few lightning counter attacks, you know, Romeo and Jed Wallace when Rowett first came in were they were electric mm. every single yeah. week. Yeah. They were just bombing down right wings. I remember that. I think it, I can't remember who it was against with Jed. I think maybe Reading at, at home, and Jed Wallace just made the defenders just fall over themselves. And yeah. it was it was very exciting. I mean, interestingly, we don't really see much of that anymore with Millwall. Rowett's, it is exactly about you're saying the system ultimately is 90% of the time it's irrelevant. I mean, there's a trend now in football, but in the championship, it's hitting massively with, I think, the majority of teams. I think over two thirds of the teams play a back three. And sometimes that just means you have to match people up and hope your players are better on the day. Um, mm. So it's it's been a changing system the majority of the sides that don't play it are the ones like Fulham and Bournemouth who will keep possession then and if Millwall can't quite do that I mean we're we're starting to keep possession more we're you know yeah Gary, we are yeah Gary yeah. Howard's side is definitely different to what Neil Harris's side was in terms yeah. of how we're looking to play but it was incredibly noticeable against Stoke on Saturday those I know exactly what you mean the little chip balls in behind with George Evans kind of they were just hitting hopes really and they weren't going into threatening positions and yeah weren't yeah. Radshaw is just just running endlessly and it's it must be so frustrating I think you see it when a phobie's playing it happens all the time for him so I think the problem with that is that Millwall's midfield maybe isn't the most creative you know we have five central midfielders who are very very similar mm. you know, five central midfielders who are workmanlike will put in a shift but you know you could pick Two, two. If you had a dartboard or you know a little tombola, two out of the five, and whoever play, whoever gets picked plays, yeah, it's not going to make a massive difference. I mean, I thought Ryan Leonard was um, very good on the weekend, as you he had the discussion with on on Saturday. Agreed, but in that sort of system, the the midfield two is really important, and when we're lacking in that area, it it, it makes it a lot harder to to entertain and to liven. And I think one of the points I make in the piece is that. 
you know, maybe we're just a bit too predictable at the moment because I think it's that the predictability. Ninety percent of the time, yeah. you know, it's get the ball to Jed Wallace. You know, <laughs> Jed Wallace gets by far the majority of our goals and assists. And if yeah. he's marked out of the game or if he's you know put under pressure all the time, we struggle. We really struggle. So you wonder at home if it's just a matter of chucking a couple extra players in the opposition half and and giving them something else to think about, but. You know, it's it's a bit more complex than that, but it's it's interesting. I, I always wonder about what is Millwall's style? You know, the fans saying they want attacking football and, and daring football. Like, you know, the, I understand that classic, like you said before, Neil Harris 4 4 2. Yeah. It, it was great when it worked, and when it didn't, it was awful. Well, he, um, got, slagged, he got slagged and slated at the end of his tenure. And, exactly. you know, we're not going to rerun all that, but club hero, club legend, that all goes out the window because of string of poor performances and results possibly exactly um, and one of the points made about harris before he left was that all he does is four four two. yeah you know that was one of the points he made and you know two years later and and everyone's calling for it to come back so it's you know you like what you know don't you yeah i mean you've got to take a pinch of salt I, I think it's a difficult job being a football manager to some extent it's like um i don't know if it's like being a politician because the politicians you get often don't lead into unpopular areas but to to some extent you've got to know your own mind and you know i suppose one of the things with gary Rout we've seen is that he is um he, i don't like the word stubborn because that implies a, stu- a kind of a stupid willingness to pursue it no matter what yeah. Um, and in fairness to him on Saturday, he abandoned clearly a system that he thinks works best to achieve the results because that's, in the end, what he's paid for. He's, he's You know, the, his league table is his ultimate end-of-year report, isn't it? You know, um, where, where did you finish? Better than last year or worse than last year? Um, equally, I, I think that he did show some depth in changing it. And, you know, I think the he described it as... Um, thriving in chaos uh, and you yeah. picked up on that quote in in the piece um the mill chaos we all know what that means and anything becomes possible and players become twice the player they they actually are um i think finding that as and when required because we have to be realistic and i think michael and i kind of touched on some of this the the expectations of fans vary with the wind at the end of the day yeah you you, you want to win and you want to see a good game um but I think you have to be realistic and know that you're up against some fairly expensively assembled sides with managers, certainly in the top part of our of our league, yeah. of some of some tactical depth. Ryan, you, you can't always pitch it at four four two either, can you? Yeah, it's 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 really hard. I think we all are in a place where you know we can't afford to to go out and spend big bucks. I mean that Stoke side, you know, probably still probably in their last year of parachute payments, maybe. And yeah. they, they've got multi-million pound players. I mean, when we played Fulham earlier in the year, what was it? Their starting lineup was about two hundred million pounds combined, or something like that. And yeah. you know, we're we're tied together with with, with string and tape at yeah. times. You know, especially when we have injuries, we don't have the deepest of squads. And that's, I mean, I really liked Rowett's line about you know when it was chaos, we thrived because mm. that was when he said that. I was a bit like, yeah, that is that is exactly what a Millwall home performance, a comeback as well, one 0 down. That is. That's how you would describe it, that chaotic energy in it. It's a cup tie atmosphere. Yeah, cup tie football, if you like. I know you were talking about it the other day about those, you know, the Neil Harris cup tie energy. And when we go on those madcap runs, that's what it is because the runs happen. There's no expectance that we're going to win per se, but it's the the feverish kind of buzz that we could win again. We might win this again. And when we went on that massive unbeaten run, that's what it was. And when it came to an end, no one was obviously wouldn't be disappointed with it at all. But no, it was just the buzz and the the what's going to happen next that kept going, and it felt like that when Millwall, when we'd scored the second, I think the energy in the ground was how many were you going to get? How yeah. many are we going to get here? Because we, we could have, maybe should have pressed on their run. I think maybe that's the only yeah. criticism from Saturday. And well, that's that's what's interesting. And then it's that's someone who you know compared to Neil Harris at least is a Millwall outsider per se in in Gary Rowett, where. I row it. I mean, um, Harris probably rolls the dice there because he understands the club and the demand. He's feeding yeah. off the crowd, and yeah, he he has yeah. that same buzz of you know we yeah. scored two in ten minutes, and we just Stoker on the on the ropes, and we just let's just keep going for it. And yeah, yeah, you know, I think with Harris sometimes that didn't pay off, but the crowd really go for it. Whereas Rowett, potentially one step disconnected, goes no, we've got the three points here. We know we can shut it out. Let's just shut it out, and. 
you know, it's it's, it's a George Graham esque, I guess, at points with the the number of one nils and the the cautious playing. But to go back to your point about the you know who we can play, potentially we don't have the the depth at Millwall. To I was looking at the squad and say, you know, if, if we were going to go to a four four two, say, mm. really we've got three strikers in the squad. You know, we've got one right winger, two left wingers. Okay, we've got a load of centre mids. Mm. You know, do we have the depth? Matt Smith can't play two games in a week, really, 90 minutes. No. Fogel is picking up knocks. Bennett's becoming a bit more unreliable this season with injuries. And then you get to the point of, but then we've got, you know, do, do you make Malone a winger? But then you've got Ojo as well. And does he fit in? And Murray Wallace. Then you're playing four centre-backs at the back. You know, Ballard's been arguably one of the best players. Do you, do you drop Cooper? I know people have kind of been mooting that. Do you drop him and play Danny Mack? Or is that too offensive it's it's interesting when Rowett does change to the back four he doesn't keep Danny McNamara on the pitch it's always Dan Ballard who's on the right yeah which is like that again probably just that cautious edge of just we keep him on and then if we need to drop back into a five we can Achtung, Milbein. I don't expect us at home to turn into the the Pirates of the Caribbean buccaneering our way through every game um, I don't think we, I mean, you, you, you make a great point about the squad, which has been assembled, um, you know, I, I know we've, we've still got the likes of John Daddy on the payroll and, and um, Ben Thompson, as you, you've mentioned him already, and he's, he's not in favour, um, neither is Connor Mahoney, I've just, as I was just looking through the article, there's a great link, which I didn't, I haven't screenshotted that, but about the multi-million pound, or not multi-million pound, but um, certainly expensive, um, you know, player called Connor Mahoney who um, doesn't seem to play very often no. um, so we, we've kind of assembled a, 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 a what should I call it 5-2-3 I'm going to go with your definition of it Ryan um, a squad suited to that that approach um, I think 4-4-2 does I mean the point of our conversation was is, is there a plan B and I think that could be plan B at the den as and when the situation demands it. I think if we've been one nil ahead on Saturday at half time rather than one nil behind, we wouldn't be talking about four four two and chancing down Eldon Road for the bus stop. No, not not at all. Not at all. And it's and that's why I think it's it's an odd one where where I say before where Rowett was rotating those formations and kind of playing at home with the back four and you do look at the squad and he played last year you know, a, a kind of a 4 2 3 one. He played Troy Parrott as a number 10 quite a lot. I remember him, yeah. He all dated <laughs> Troy Parrott, who now is MK Doms' third best striker, you know. And, uh, you know, maybe that was a personnel issue rather than an assistant issue, but you can't argue with the fact that that didn't really work either. No, you know, no, 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 no. Far from it. Not, it's not as though he has tried. One, one thing, actually, that does stand out when you're looking back is over the last two years, everyone always harps back to that that 3-0 against Forest, probably Mill was best result. Hmm. Really exciting game on the road and then just coronavirus comes straight in. We played a back four away from home. Rowett kind of surprised everyone. He saw and that game, I mean, I love that game because it was 3-0 halftime. It was a perfectly executed plan based on how yeah. the opposition play. I think it was basically, we know Joe Lolly and Matty Cash, who's now at Villa, was just going to bomb forward down the right. And I think he had Shane Ferguson and Murray Wallace there saying, OK, we'll just shut them down. And every time it was just pinging balls into that that left-hand channel where they'd gone. You know, yeah. all of the crosses, both of the crosses came from Murray Wallace on that side of the pitch. And then obviously the goal from the corner as well. And it was a perfect plan. And it, 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 it was a massive marker of Gary Rowett studying an opposition, looking at how they play. Because at that time, Forrest were flying as well. I mean, Mil Yeah, they were uh, up, up there, yeah. yeah. And... And it was an, a perfect example of him looking at a team going, right, this is how they play. This is the plan we're going to execute it. And that was really exciting for me is that we've, we've got a manager now who, you know, to compare it with Neil Harris during his time at Millwall, at least, rather than a manager say, we play four four two, and this is how we play every game. We're looking at someone who goes, OK, well, what can we do to change with the players we've got to, to break down an opposition? And it worked perfectly. And that it does start to concern you when, he kind of has abandoned that and gone, right, this is how we play. And when you are a side like Millwall, who don't have the riches of other clubs, don't necessarily have the ability of other other squads, at least, but we have form, we have atmosphere, we have, you know, the best dressing room in yeah. England, according to every player that comes in and out of the club. 
um, you've got to use your other your other um, the other tools. That's right, yeah, and they, they, these so, are our weapons, aren't they? Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to come back to the a point I made to myself here. I mean, it's it's mixing it up. It's 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 not being predictable, and I think that was the downfall of Neil Harris because we, you know, he his his world came apart at Fulham when four four two his version of four four two. Um, kind of fell apart because four four two doesn't have to mean that you're just a long ball relentless. Um, no, not at all. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember Milan winning the European Cup, as I still call it, in the in the nineties with four four two. I mean, albeit played with world level players, but mm. you know, it, it doesn't have to be lump it. And I think that's 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 always the thing that um, as soon as you become known as a side that does that, which I think is possibly the danger that we're you know we're, we're trying to deal with here. Then other teams know what to expect, and that's your undoing. Um, whether five three two, five two three, four four two, whatever you like, I think as long as you're not predictable and can change it mid game. Yeah. So no, no asks a lot of players. Um, takes you back to the quality of the squad, possibly, Ryan. But yeah. it's it's changing as we did on Saturday. Um, when you when the other side least least expects it, which will yeah, be key that, for us. That flexibility is a massive a massive um, benefit. And a massive advantage when when you can have that, where you're going into a game and the opposition doesn't quite know how to prepare, maybe or doesn't yeah. quite know how you can change. And like you say, at half time you can just go right. We're gonna this isn't quite working. We're gonna swap that around. Like against Blackpool, I know a lot of people weren't happy, even though we got the win in the end. It was quite frustrating because he did keep it with a back five for so long against a, a side with ten men. And as soon as we did change it to a four four two, then we got the goals. You know, as we did before, do you sometimes have to roll the dice? Like I said before, like Neil Harris would. Sometimes you have to. And you know, if we'd had lost t- t- against Blackpool, a ten-man Blackpool, then you know the atmosphere dips then because that that win, you know, kind of helped spark us on for a bit. Yeah. But sometimes you've got to be daring, and and eventually does make the change, and we do win. You know, that it isn't just one style. It doesn't just mean. I mean, we do play very direct directly, and it is how we play. And it's you know, there's no secret about that. Every manager. Whenever they come to the den afterwards in the press conference, say, you know what you're going to get here. It's going to be a really tough physical game. The crowd are going to get on your back. And yeah. that is, the, I mean, it's like they have, they must, on the way into the press box, someone just might pass my sheet of paper and go, oh, by the way, you're not supposed to say. They all say it. And it's, you know, I'm sure all managers say it about every opposition. But with Millwall, it, it, it's really, really true. We are physical and we are direct. And it does work against a lot of teams. And, you know, being direct isn't a negative. I mean, West Brom currently, you know, one of the three best sides in the division. They play the most long balls out of anyone in the league. You know, they just pump the ball forward all the time, but they've got really good players who can finish all the chances. Well, so- that was the point I was just writing to myself is that, you know, we, we've mentioned resources and I don't want to flog this listeners, but, you know, um, I often read online and you hear it, Ryan, about, oh, you know, all these other clubs have great managers that can change, make strategic substitutions, change it. Um and they're often bringing on European style players of of some <laughs> some value. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, we we we've we've mentioned our squad. And I, I'm not here to flog our squad because I think they're a great bunch of blokes. But you know, unfortunately, we can't bring game changers or ones that seem to be in favour. Uh, maybe the only ones we do have don't don't feature yeah. for reasons that are, are hard to fathom. But um, but other clubs can bring, you know, often international level players off the bench. And yeah, yeah, that will change things, won't it? Yeah, it has been demoralizing at times this season when it's a it's one or at the time and you go, right, it needs to change the game, and you you see George Evans stripped and ready to come on, you go, oh, it's not quite gonna change the game, is it? But you know, no, no, that's where we're at, and that's why I mean, I think for for Rowett, you know, it's it like like we said at the big at the top of this, it's it is, it's a weird atmosphere because he is, by any standards, in terms of league position and points, doing really well and has yeah. been for two or three years. But he seems to be... hes I don't think he's under pressure from the club at all. Well, that was, uh, that was going to be the, the concluding point. I mean, I, I think Saturday's win and the win at, at Sheffield yeah. dispensed with the row out movement. I think, you know, for yeah, better well, or for worse, he's in I, for the season. I, I, think, I think the club, like, I don't think it's really within a question that the club would get rid of him. Um, I don't think really at any point with, with the fans maybe not being so happy, I don't think that's ever really been on the cards or, you know, even mooted because we're, we're doing well and we're, that's where the club the club are realistic about how much we can afford. It's been a, a tough year with COVID, the amount of money we've lost. 
Yeah. So being in the championship really is is the biggest priority. But in terms of the fans, there is a palpable split. You know, and it, maybe it's not quite 50-50. Maybe the wins, back-to-back wins this week have eased that. But there is, without any denial, a split. You know, even Harry in our own podcast, he he wants Gary Rowe at one, Gary Rowe at one more than he wants Christmas. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think... I think that, that you can't. And he loves Christmas, Harry. Oh, he loves Christmas, <laughs> Harry. But, uh, if he could, you know, you send an out P forty five, but but there is that group of fans who do want him out. And I, this, I guess, my my point of the piece is that maybe by playing, you know, what the fans want to see. I know every fan kind of thinks they could be a manager, but if they if they can see some more performances like we saw in the second half against Stoke. Rowett, I think, will ease a lot of that, not necessarily pressure, but that that discontent towards him. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that Stoke game, brilliant kind of summary for it. The, the Stoke chanted, Gary Rowett, your football is shit, and the home fans applauded <laughs> along with it. It's, you know, it's, you couldn't laugh. It more. was, it was, I, I, I had to laugh. I mean, when I got, when I get home on Saturday, this is my wife says, how was the football? I said, well, at half time, the manager was going to be sacked or, a, you know, a gallows erected in the car park. <laughs> And by the end of ninety minutes, he was being all the you know metaphorically cheered and carried out on the people's shoulders. So there's yeah, a football it's... manager's life in a nutshell. That yeah, five it's... minutes. <laughs> Mill was a changeable place. I mean, I did. He did. He did deny that this is what he was doing. But I did like at the end of the game when he ran straight over to the Stoke fans to give them one. I mean, <laughs> you, you've got to admire that, and that is a very Mill attitude. I think. I think we might yeah. be starting to get to him, but. Um, yeah. So I just think maybe maybe if he can if he can change it up and it works. Obviously, the the key thing is if it works. You can play four four two for the next five games. If we lose all five, people still won't be happy. But no, no. if he can, you know, whether it is being a bit more daring, and you know, maybe it depends on who we're playing. If we're if we're on top in a game, maybe again just changing it at half time, taking that risk. If he can start doing that, and we can start seeing some of the football that we saw on Saturday, because like I said before, it was it was excellent. And it was Millwall and it was exciting. If he can start doing that, then he will just get more and more fans on side. And that in itself snowballs at Millwall. If he can start getting more and more fans on side and the den get louder and louder and fuller and fuller, then it just snowballs. And that is going to be a big weapon as well if he wants to target the top six. So, you know, it's 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 man management, but rather than managing the 25 he's got, he's... He's having to unfortunately manage twelve and a half thousand, but you know that that all comes with the job. If he keeps producing second half performances as, as we saw against Stoke, and we're sitting tenth in the table, if he can keep producing those at home, he'll probably look forward to getting a Christmas card from Harry. That would be that would be if he can win Harry round by the end of the year. That truly will be a Christmas miracle. But generally, you know, I mean, the, 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 you know, uh, just to finish us, Ron. I mean, the, the division is apart from the elite. Uh, top three, I think, Bournemouth, Fulham, uh, West Brom. The division isn't that outstanding. I mean, I'm, I'm not knocking any of the other clubs. I think they're all fairly workmanlike journeyman sides. And, you know, we're one of them, I think. Um, was, was it seven teams on 21? And they've got Blackburn yeah. on 20, just behind that group. Um, and you can go down to Sheffield United in 14th, really, and possibly Forest and Swansea. And they're on 17. So, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity here and I think bringing Den into it, I'm glad that we had Saturday because the contrast maybe for Gary Rout will illustrate what a weapon the Den can be post-COVID. I think it's been a long while since any yeah. of us, including him, will have seen that. And that, you know, that if you're looking for um, marginal differences in that group, then the Den has to be in the, in, in, the, in the mix because that is something that nobody else has in that group. Yeah, massively. And I think maybe that that COVID year has probably not helped there being quite a little bit of a disconnect between Rowett and the fans, um, or at yeah. least some of the fans, just in the fact that they haven't been, they haven't got to see him. All they've really got is his post-match interviews. And, you know, they were lauded when he first came in. But after a while, when the only voice you hear is the managers, you can it can start to turn people because, you know, they think they're being sold a dream. But no, I think I think if, if we can see a bit more of what we saw against Stoke, um, then I've got no doubt that that we can keep the run going and uh, and make a really good fist of it this year. And and for Millwall to be in the top ten of the championship is a is an achievement, is a massive achievement given our budget, given our you know popularity and and the and the the quality of some of the sides in this division. I think um, you know we're on the right path, and 
hopefully, Nick, we're, we're starting to see something that that will turn the crowd in in a, in a positive mood. Always a weapon. Huge thank you, Ryan. Thank you for taking time out of your day, mate. I really appreciate it. Great article. I'll stick a link to the article on the show notes when we put this out, and I might put this out later on this afternoon. So um, there we are. Thank you, Ryan Loftus. Appreciate thank your time, you very mate. Much, Nick. Enjoy, um, enjoy the rest of your cricket this afternoon. Uh. <laughs> I'm sure we'll see you sticking yourself to the, the streets of, uh, of London shortly. When, when you do run out of things to do in retirement, probably a week or two away from, from joining oh, that in Britain. Apart from the heart attack, listeners, I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Arriva Dirty Millwall, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to Aston Millwall. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a cheeky little review. Arriva Dirty Millwall, till next time. Who do you want to watch? <laughs>